Yeah, it helps if I open the, the right sermon. We want to look at um, verses 18 to 25. Quite sobering words when you come to them after having been through what we've been through. I found these quite challenging as I read them. And I want to, to address them as the Lord Jesus has given them as a means to help us cope with hatred. Now that word itself makes us sort of, well it makes me sort of react, doesn't it? The best I can think about is that this is a reminder that when you follow Jesus, there's a cost involved. The Bible doesn't talk about the cost all the time, but it does talk about the cost from time to time. You might consider it like the small print. You know, when you, you buy something by an agreement, quite often on the internet now, you're asked to you agree with all these um, um, arrangements, and of course, who reads the small print? You click the button, and it's not until perhaps something goes wrong that you think, where, where did this come from? And you go back and you check the small print, and it was there all the time. So, if you want, this is not small print. It's a big issue. But it's an aspect of being a Christian which we don't talk about a lot. And I don't think we should either. We need to be aware of it. We need to recognize that when trouble comes, it's not because God's lost control. That when trouble comes, God is still exactly where he was before it arrived. We'll be all the way through it and will bring us out the other end. But why do God's people have trouble? I've got three subheadings for you, which I hope to show you from the text. First of all, you're different. Secondly, you're disciples. And thirdly, you are delivered. Let me see if I can show you what I mean. Verse 18. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. You are different. Jesus Christ has made us different by calling us to faith in himself and giving us the grace to believe we are a distinct and different kind of people though we have a great deal in common with the people around us we've got the same number of arms and legs usually we have lives which are very similar to their lives our occupations our entertainments to a degree but ultimately we are different we're a community and where the world finds difficulty with people is when they set themselves apart or are set apart and don't muck in the same as everybody else because uh, we are indeed distinct. We follow the Lord Jesus. We've been called by him into a specific lifestyle and world pattern. And of course, for that reason, the world looks on us sometimes just with amusement, but at other times with positive hatred and persecution. In a world where they talk a lot about toleration, the one thing they don't like to tolerate is a group that says we've got the truth, we are in the right way, and we need therefore great grace to know how to do it. Look at the beginning of verse 18 and just meditate on that word, if the world hates you. In Greek, there are different ways of expressing that word, if. And the way it's written in the text here means that this is already true. Means that it's already happening. That the disciples have begun to feel something of the ostracizing power or effect of being a follower of Jesus Christ. They're looked upon as different and the world around them thinks that they are less than human to some degree. That's the effect that Jesus has. If you remember back in John chapter 9, there's a blind man who was given his sight. And we are told in there that the Jews summoned the parents to see what had happened. And in verse 22 of chapter 9, it says, His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if anyone confessed that he was Christ, that's Jesus was Christ, 
he would be put out of the synagogue. So even during Jesus' lifetime, there was this build-up of um, hatred. There's no other word that sums it up. When John writes many years later, 1 John 3, Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. Do not marvel that the world hates you. I hope you don't take a lot of time meditating on this thing. But, but it is something you need to recognise, as I said, that this is the small print. And when you begin to think about it, you begin to notice that the Lord of Glory was in fact flagging this up continually. Matthew 5, 11, the Beatitudes, blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you for my name's sake. Because you're my follower, because you are one who has been called out by me to be part of a distinct community. Distinct, as it says, from the world. That word in the Bible can be used in a number of different ways. But here it's repeated five times in close proximity. It wants you to understand that there is... a a, a different way of operating from the way that you and I now operate the world as it's used in this passage means human society says one of my books organised and functioning apart from God by implication then Christ's disciples are a human society functioning in the presence of God and their dear friends is the nub of our difference Another book says it's the realm of evil, the society of wicked men who have set themselves against Christ and his kingdom. We've seen some very wicked acts this week in society. But the ultimate wicked act is to set up society in opposition to God. And of course, that is always upon us. The the legislation that was discussed in the House of Lords on Friday about allowing uh, assisted suicide just comes from the people who have no concept of there being a God to answer to. They see themselves merely as animals who can decide what happens to the animal if at the end of its days it's too weak to function as they think it should. So this idea of the world is common in scripture. You remember, even during the temptation of the Lord Jesus, the devil took Jesus up onto the mountain and showed him the kingdoms of the world. This this whole society which is in opposition with or to God. That's the story of the Bible. God formed a perfect society. Men broke it, and from that day on then there has been this tension. There have been two groups in the world, God's people and those who are in rebellion against God. They don't always come out and be as hateful as they can be, but in effect, when the Bible sums up their position, they do indeed hate God. The word hate itself means to be hostile, To have an aversion for. It goes beyond that though, doesn't it? If you think of something that you hate, there will be something in your life that you don't think, oh, I hate that. It's something which you really dislike. Now, I had real trouble with this, preparing the sermon this week. I, I don't perceive of myself as somebody that's hated. As a human being, I want to be liked. I like to have around me a community of people who know something of my shortcomings yet still put up with me but the saviour is very very clear hate here stands in glaring contrast with love if you cast your eye back to verse 17 these things I command you that you love one another that's the community but now moving from the community to the world if the world hates you if the world hates you Christians, therefore, should not be surprised that unbelievers at times drop their mask and become enemies of the gospel. It's happened since the beginning of the time of time, since that day when Cain murdered his own brother. The two ways have been in the world. What is it that's made us different? It is a work of grace. I chose you out of the world. 
This is a reminder, you see, that God in his Son has actually decided by saving us that we should be different to the world. And that we should stay in the world after we were saved. John 17, 15. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. He has established his kingdom. And in the pages of time, he calls men and women through the gospel to, to move from the kingdom of the darkness, as it says in Colossians, into the kingdom of his love or the son of his love. And that transfer now means that there are two opposite groups. Each of these disciples had literally been called from being fishermen, from being tax gatherers, from other kinds of jobs to follow Jesus and to identify with him by following him. That's discipleship. They are to find love in their community, but they have to recognize that outside their community they'll be often in trouble. This idea of choosing goes right back into eternity, doesn't it? He chose us in him, says Ephesians 1, 4, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And it's this call to be holy, this call to be different, this call to live according to God's light, truth and word, rather than what society decides that makes us different and that the world finds so much trouble with. The world around us, you see, is selfish. It focuses on what suits its best. And by being a Christian, you to some degree have declared, my priority now is not simply to see what suits me best. I'm here to serve God. I'm here to glorify him by my words, by my life, by my priorities, by showing the world that he is worthy to be served and by loving my brothers and sisters. And it's for that reason the world finds us offensive. It hates them, says Montgomery Boyce, because they are not of it. It hates them for being different. doesn't hate us for being superior but it hates us for being servants. The world that we live in doesn't like people who stick out. You see it with children at school, don't you? From very young years, you have to be careful for, for bullying. I remember even in this school, when our kids were here, there were issues of bullying. And it has to be dealt with very, very quickly. Because children tend to sort of identify somebody who's different and then oppress them. But it's not just children, is it? It comes up down, comes up through society. So that whenever somebody wants to be different, well, we might chuckle and laugh at them if they're odd and eccentric, but if they're actually going to say that how they are is how we should be, then you can feel the hackles of the world rising. And dear friends, you and I must, must see that that's exactly what happened to our Lord Jesus Christ. Mr. Spurgeon has an excellent sermon on this. I'll refer to it again later. But he, he, he runs through the life of Christ and asks you, what was there about him to hate? And yet people did. He wasn't in the world for many days before the king sent an army to kill him. What had he done wrong? He was, as we would say, an innocent baby. From the very beginning, you see, there are two kingdoms in this world. And in one of them, there's a vicious, wild enemy who hates the very fact that we exist. And if he can stir up people to oppress us, that's exactly what we'll get. You've, you've all felt it to some degree, though we don't get the, the, the real painful persecution that other Christians have had or are even having in other parts of the world. You felt it when it's, somebody's asked you or was talking to you and you tell them you're a Christian and you can just suddenly feel the coolness. You can feel the distance. My best friend when I was a teenager hasn't spoken to me in 40 years. And the only thing I can find that, that changed was I became a Christian. 
And as you go through life, you'll find that over and over. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. You shouldn't be surprised. And at the heart of that, that, that rejection... At the heart of that rejection is this world's view that they are right and nobody else can tell them otherwise. So it becomes very important then for the Christian to go back to the earlier parts of this chapter, to remember he's the vine, to abide in him, to, to abide in his love, to know the joy that comes from being a Christian, to understand the peace that passes all understanding because you're now in a living relationship with God. That is to be your oasis in this world where you find yourself in difficulty. When the world looks at us, it doesn't see us as a positive movement. It only sees us as negative. Well, you don't do that. You don't do this. You're always against. And that's how they want to paint us. You've only to go to some of the websites of places that have been arguing in, in, the, in the, the, the gay and lesbian argument and marriage argument over the last year or so and look at the responses of those who were against Christians. It's never, oh dear, you're wrong. It's often a great page of expletives and, uh, and curses and, and that, dear friends, is just there. Because we've left the kingdom of darkness. Now what can you say to a person who's not a Christian? Come into the church. You'll experience the wonder of the love of Christ and the love of his people. But we have to be honest with you. It will also mean that you've got to step away from the, the, the way the world is. And the truth is worse than that. Because as long as you're not a Christian, you're part of that world that hates us. Who would want to be there? Dear friends, we need to get people to understand that we are followers of Jesus. And when we do, you can rest assured you're going to feel the cost of it. The cost that is yours because you are a disciple. Verse 20, the world, remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. <coughs> If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. <coughs> Here's the issue, you see. They, they have no communion with God. And because of that, when they come to those who are Jesus' disciples... They see in Jesus something that's offensive, someone that's offensive, and we are his representatives. And then what they will do is they will persecute the church for Jesus' sake. And so as they stand with him in the dark, as they're moving toward the Garden of Gethsemane, and very soon there's going to be soldiers with weapons very soon the Savior is going to be dragged away, beaten, thrashed, and murdered. The believers need to understand that while it's not nice, while we're not to love it, we're not to be surprised by it. Religious people hated the Lord Jesus. Isn't that what you get through the Bible? They were continually looking and scheming for ways to capture him, to silence him. Why? Because the more he said, the more embarrassed that they were. They had this concept that they were good. I came across a little video by Francis Chan. I don't know if you've ever listened to him. He's a pastor in California. Uh, he's of sort of Chinese extract. But he has, a, he has a, a, an uncanny insight into life. And what caught my attention was that um, he, he titled it The Two Worst Lies in the World. It's only six minutes long. It's worth watching. The two worst lies in the world. The first lie, he says, is that people think people are basically good. And the second lie is that God will never bring anybody to judgment. Jesus, in his life, established very clearly that in even the most culturally respectable people of his days, there is, in fact, 
not just a streak, but a, a whole powerful bent of hatred that will result in persecution. It hated me before it hated you. In the Greek it says, it, it has hated me and it still hates me and it will hate you. He came to his own, says John, in verse 11 of chapter 1. And his own did not receive him. In John chapter 7 the Saviour says, The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. John 8, 48, then the Jews answers and said to him, Do we not rightly say that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? The Saviour speaks like he does here, so that when we get ourselves, or find ourselves in real serious trouble, we'll not be crushed by it. What, will be, what, what should happen is we should be comforted by the fact that that this is exactly where the Saviour himself has been. And by being there for his sake, we are following in his footsteps. If they persecuted me, the, 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 the move from hatred to persecution is important. The word persecute means to pursue like a wild animal. <coughs> if you want, hatred can be passive, can't it? It can just be a feeling inside somebody. But persecution is when hatred moves on to hostility. When hatred moves on to harassing, persecuting. And all the way through John's Gospel, the testimony is. That's precisely what the Jews were doing. Chapter 5, 16. For this reason the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him. Because he had done those things on the Sabbath. The same chapter, therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he had not only broke the Sabbath but also said that God was his father making himself equal with God. And ultimately that persecution was realised on Calvary. Peter tells us that him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God you have taken by lawless hands have crucified and put to death. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Here we have it in clear, concrete evidence that following Jesus Christ will bring people into situations where it won't just be words. There will also be acts of violence. You read the Acts of the Apostles and you find quite clearly that as Paul went from city to city, he found himself in great trouble. When he writes to the Corinthians, chapter 4, verse 12, he says, We labour, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we endure. Or later on in 2 Corinthians, chapter 4, verse 9, he describes himself as persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. When he writes to Timothy, he says in 2 Timothy 3.12, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Dear friends, we've been privileged in this country, haven't we? We've, in recent years, at the, the very worst, had bad things said about us. I don't consciously, I'm not consciously aware of anybody being physically attacked for being a Christian. But you can tell me otherwise at the door if you want. But history is resplendent with accounts. Within the first 300 years of Christianity, there are what they call the ten waves of persecution. Christians living quietly would find themselves in conflict with society. And sometimes what happened then was the society found in the Christians somebody to blame for their troubles. And they were fed to lions. They were roasted alive. They were sawn in two. And you don't have to stop just with the first 300 years. 
follow history down, generation after generation. Come to the Reformation, think about the city of Oxford and look at the people who were burned alive there. Go to Edinburgh in the time of the Covenanters to the grass market and it's, it's well known for the number of young men and women who were horrendously tortured before they were dispatched to meet God. But you don't have to go that far back. Go to the mission fields of the world and see how people have stepped off boats to bring the gospel to the cannibals in the Fiji Islands, the South Sea Islands, and, and, and then became the main meal for lunch. Oh dear friends, I could just pluck account after account after account out of my mind. There's something about me wants to shut it all away and say, oh yes, I know, but... But here's the Lord Jesus saying, don't be surprised when you're persecuted. That's exactly what they did to me. And if you're living for me, if you're following me, then you can expect it as well. Don Carson writes, are there no painful aspects to being a Christian? Is all happiness and light, though Christ himself was a man of sorrows who walked through the valley of the shadow of death? Do we participate only in his joy, but not in his tears? Do, does he alone bear the cross? And I hope by now you're saying, of course not. I've seen it in the Bible that there's a cross to bear. Sometimes it can be very personal. Sometimes it can be very private. Just something that's torturing you because somebody has decided that your life should be miserable. But it's painful just the same. And it's in places like this that we are to come and to find comfort. All these things they will do to you for my name's sake. When Peter writes his epistle, he, he warns the saints, doesn't he, that persecution's coming. But he makes this very clear emphasis that if you're going to get in trouble, make sure it's for the gospel and not just because you're cranky. And we need to pray constantly because we all have different temperaments. We need to make sure when we get into trouble, it's because we are representing Jesus Christ with love and compassion rather than being awkward and obnoxious. The scriptures are clear. All these things. What are they? Verse 18, they will hate you. Verse 19, they won't love you. Verse 20, they will persecute you. Watch out for yourselves, the Saviour says in Mark 13. For they will deliver you up to councils. You will be beaten in the synagogues. You will be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony to them. Here is the crux of the matter, says Montgomery Boyce. Why does the world hate Christians? It hates them because it hates their master. Hatred does not exist because of what Christians are in themselves. They are nothing. It does not exist because of what they have done. They are harmless. Or at least they should be. Hatred exists because the world hates Jesus. And because Christians are identified with him by virtue of his call. Hatred exists because the world hates Jesus. Now I hope you're struggling with this, because I am. We live in a well-to-do society where everything goes well, and we're all good friends with anybody that wants to be good friends with us. It therefore becomes a real challenge to us to look at this and to recognise just what has happened and can happen at the just... Just at the, the turn or a flick of a switch, imagine what it was like for the church in Iraq until about, what is it, three or four years ago. It was a thriving church. It's been there for 1,700 years. I saw one, one comment on it which says it was there before Muhammad was wearing nappies. And what's happening now to these dear brothers and sisters? They are being treated as the scum of the earth. They are being killed, oppressed. Should we be surprised? No. Should we be compassionate? Most definitely, yes. Should be in all our prayer. We should be looking for ways to see how we can physically help them. 
But we shouldn't be surprised because this is how the enemy has worked in generation, generation after generation. And God wants us to be in the world to challenge it. He wants us to be here so that the world never gets to the point where it thinks our way is the right way. You and I are the catalyst. And as a catalyst, we're often under extreme pressure before real good is accomplished. Are you ready to follow this Saviour? Are you ready to walk with him and to live for his glory? You will be if you're enjoying the power of his presence, the wondrous of your sins being forgiven. You will be if you know that he loves you. You will be if you know that you have peace with God, that you're part of the family of God and you have the hope of heaven. If you've not got those things functioning and, and operating, you are misfiring. And your journey will be a dreadful one. Can you remember the days when cars used to do that? I had a little reliant Robin with its 800cc engine. And it used to blow the head gasket. And I'd be in Edinburgh often visit my mother-in-law and we had to get home 30 miles. And we'd crawl along the road banging and clunking and backfiring. Once the engine's fixed it runs like a sweetie. That's life. As we live in this world, we're going to find ourselves often in awkward situations. Because the world doesn't like what you and I stand for. The world doesn't like what you and I are saying to them. The world, if you get it down to the very core of its being, hates Jesus Christ. Again, secular humanism is on the rampage, isn't it? You've only to look at things written by Dawkins and the whole entourage that now follows him. They don't speak coherently. I may have told you it's a few weeks since I was picked up by the No God Squad on Twitter. And this guy decided that I, I was less than human and had no real reason to be alive. Any attempts at discussion were merely deluged with garbage. It's out there. There are people who feel like that and they're not constrained by, by the, the normal limits of society. We shouldn't be surprised. Why? Because we've actually been delivered from sin and judgment. This is the only trouble we'll ever experience. When we enter into God's presence, then there's peace and joy forevermore. The worst they can do to you is dispatch you to meet God early. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin, verse 22. But now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. That's profound. You cannot worship God without loving Jesus. All other religions are therefore wrong. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. But this has happened. Please notice how he's now referring to the Psalms. But this has happened that the word might be fulfilled which is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. He knew this was going to happen when he came to this world and he still came here to save us. That's the love of God. Jesus says, these people hate me and the Father because by my being here in the world... I expose their sin. That's their response to being shown what's wrong with them. Because in actual fact there was nothing wrong with them. They hated me without a cause. It's just another affirmation of the perfect sinlessness of the Lord Jesus Christ. They hated me without a cause, without any valid reason. They had no legitimate cause 
to hate Jesus because he was the only sinless man that ever lived. He is the Son of God. But there is an illegitimate cause for hating him. And that is his teaching and the miracles he did. He came to them and he spoke. And in his speech, had I not spoken to them, they would have no sin. In his speech, what, they, what he did was he, he exposed the fact that they were sinners, that they were rebels, that they would not bow the knee to the living God, that they wanted to climb into heaven on their own ladder. And then by his miracles, he made it very clear, if I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. His miracles made it very clear that, that he was actually who he claimed to be. Water into wine. Fish and bread feeding thousands. Seas suddenly calmed. Dead made to live. Who can do that kind of thing? He's no ordinary bloke. You will always find things to find fault with any human being. Just be in the company long enough and you'll find something about them that annoys you. They'll have an opinion here or there which you dislike. So you can always find something about another person for which to build a case for not liking them and perhaps even to hate them if you think their views are too extreme or their actions are too extreme. But if you had come alongside Jesus, you would have found absolutely nothing about him that was repulsive. He's altogether lovely. The fairest upon ten thousands to my soul. But he was scorned. He was reviled. Why? Because he came speaking the words of life. And those words of life showed the rebellious heart of men and women showed that men and women were sinners who wouldn't listen to God. And his miracles confirmed it. He is God's revelation of himself to mankind. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, he has revealed him. Show us the Father we saw in chapter 14. Philip, have I been with you so long and, and you've not recognized me? And so the challenge keeps coming back to the people. Why is it that you won't embrace Jesus? Why is it that you won't become a Christian? And the answer is because you hate God. You hate him because of what he tells you about yourself. You're not ready to believe his assessment of your character. You still somewhere harbour an imaginary thought that really I'm good at heart. And finally God will realise it one day. Listen, he wrote the books so that you'd realise he knows you better than you do. He wrote the books so that nobody would ever be in any doubt. In John chapter 9, again, blind Bartimaeus has been healed, hasn't he? The Saviour is speaking to the folks around him. If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, we see, therefore your sin remains. You know, if, it, if you had never realised what I'm teaching you, if you had never experienced what I've done amongst men, then there'd be some excuse. But in actual fact, there is no excuse. And Christians, like you and I, are hated because we stand in this world as living testimonies to the Lord Jesus Christ. We are books which are read by men and women. They know where you are this morning. And by your being here, you're saying to the people who are not here, there's something wrong with you. And it's more than something wrong. You're actually lost and in dreadful, eternal danger. That's our function as a church. And that's how you can tell the true church from the false church, isn't it? The false church, everybody loves it. It's a great place. Because it never says to men and women, you're a sinner, God's holy. You need to repent. You need to believe in the Lord Jesus. It says, oh, we're all nice people. Fooey. The two greatest lies in the world. That people are basically good and that God won't judge. How do I know? Here it's in front of me. That's why he came. 
And that's why you and I will be persecuted. That's why you and I need to recognize we're not to be surprised when we get into trouble for being a Christian. Just make sure it's because you're a Christian and not because you're a troublemaker. Not to be surprised for getting into trouble as a Christian. In actual fact, we're to be encouraged. I'm going to finish with something which is slightly amusing because it's been a serious subject. Apparently, John Wesley was riding along a road one day when it dawned on him that three whole days had passed in which he had suffered no persecution. Not a brick or an egg had been thrown at him for three days. So being alarmed, he stopped his horse and cried out, Can it be that I've sinned and I'm backslidden? So getting down from his horse, he went on his knees and began praying to God that he would show him where there was a fault in his life. At that point, a, a, a ruffian was passing by on the other side of the hedge and he could hear them Wesley praying. So he looked across and he says, I'll fix that Methodist preacher. So he picked up a brick and threw it at him. It missed. It fell harmlessly beside him. But immediately John Wesley jumped to his feet, exclaiming, Thank God, it's all right. I still have his presence. I'm not volunteering for any persecution. I'd like to go to my final resting place in perfect peace and harmony. But neither am I deluded. If I'm going to follow Jesus, I have to cope with the fact that for some people, that will be very offensive. Amen.